heard of this man. The article was about Warren Buffett. He's a billionaire investor and the CEO of a multi-industry company named Berkshire Hathaway. What's interesting about him is that every year for the last couple of years, uh, sorry, last couple of decades, he hasn't made his time as an auction so that the winner could have a lunch date with him. Surprisingly, people would spend millions of dollars to have lunch with Warren Buffett. According to the article so far, Buffett has raised over 34 million US dollars for the last two decades, selling lunch time. Last year, it was a new record. A Chinese crypto founder won the auction and he spent $4.6 million to have one lunch date with Warren Buffett. The Forbes, the newspaper says that this year's price for that special annual meal with him would be even more expensive because he has decided it will be the last one. So who's going to bid? <laughs> and no one knows what they would talk about on this special lunch date with him. But apparently people think that it is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that is worth millions of dollars. People believe that a meal with this man would make them as rich and wise as him and perhaps change their life forever. This morning, what if I told you there is somebody who is better than Warren Buffett? And this man offers to a meal, have a meal with you. What if I told you there is someone who is a lot wiser than the billionaire and he can change your eternal destiny and that he invites you to have a meal with him? Would you respond to that invitation? The man who invites you to a meal is Jesus. In the Gospels, in the New Testament of the Bible, we see Jesus take people out for meals. We see Jesus show up at people's parties and people's dinners. And we see Jesus accept people's invitations to go to their houses and eat with them. And seemingly, Jesus does not care whether you are poor or rich, whether you are troubled or prideful. He would just extend his friendship to others regardless of their backgrounds. And very interestingly, whoever eats a meal with Jesus becomes a new person and their life turns upside down completely. The new sermon series is titled, A Meal with Jesus. This is to say that you are invited to a meal with Jesus. And this is to say that whatever season of life you're in, and wherever you are coming from, and whatever you are going through now, there is hope. And Jesus can reset and restore your life. For the next few weeks, we will be looking at the accounts in the Gospels where Jesus has meals with others. And through the stories, we would see ourselves having a meal with Jesus and have a meaningful and life-changing conversations with him. This morning, we'll be looking at the story of a guy named Matthew and how his meal with Jesus changed his life. Now, before we delve into the story, I want us to think about something. If you were to write somebody's biography, what are the things that you'd study about the person? You'd include in their biography their family history, stories about their childhood, their achievements, and episodes that would reveal their character and values but you'd hardly write about the meals that they would eat with their friends. You know, biography should be 
talking about something more exciting and informative. Eating with the people is mundane, and it is an ordinary part of life, is it not? But in the collection of Jesus' biographies, so-called Gospels in the New Testament, it's mentioned 16 times that Jesus eats with somebody. Eating with somebody is a big part of Jesus' life and his ministry. Why is that? Here is why. In the Jewish culture of Jesus' day, you're identified with the people who you ate with whom you ate with told who you were. Having meals with others was how you formed a sense of identity in Jesus' culture. How would somebody know if they were a part of a family in Jesus' culture? They ate with them. How would somebody know if they, uh, somebody was your friend in Jesus' day? You ate with them. Eating with somebody showed where you belonged and where you were included. Now, before we go any further, there is something valuable that we can learn from this Jewish understanding of mealtimes. And you might find it very interesting. In the Jewish culture, dinner was the heart of family life. As many of you would know, a day in the Jewish calendar goes completely opposite to our calendar. Whereas a day in our calendar begins and ends at midnight, a Jewish day goes from nightfall to nightfall. In other words, we think that a day begins at sunrise, but Jewish people thought that a day began at sunset. In the morning, of course, we go to work, and at night, we are with family. We are with our family. Whilst people in the modern world would think that a day begins with work in the morning, Jewish people would think that a day begins with their family at sunset, and you finish the day with work. Jewish people had their priorities flipped. For them, family time was a priority, not their work. And the dinner with the family was the key event of the day. A couple of years ago, a local church in Korea started a little project. In that church, there were so many broken families and hurting couples. Then a pastor came up with an idea. He encouraged couples and families to commit to having dinner together at least three times a week and during the dinner at the dining table, everyone had to share at least one thing that they could thank God for that day. That meant that working moms and dads had to give up on some of the night shifts to be with the family. That meant some couples had to give up on their night TV show to be with each other for three nights a week. And that meant teenagers at home had to lock in some nights during the week to be with their families. Not everyone in the church participated, but for those who did, the results were amazing. After some months into this initiative, it was reported that relationships in families started healing. Moms and dads became happier and more productive at work, and they started making more money. And teenagers started talking at home. It was a miracle. <laughs> the quality of a family life dramatically improved in the church as they started having meals together. Living in the modern world today, we tend to think that success would give us happiness and that we would have to sacrifice relationships for success. But did you know that the statistics actually suggest that 90% of our happiness has to do with how well we do relationships with our family and others? 
Here, Jesus' biography includes so many accounts of eating with others to teach us one thing about life. That is, life is better when you do it with others. Children need, need you at home, as Gabi told me many times. <laughs> and your spouse needs you at home. Someone who lives next door needs you. We need each other. Here at PPUC, we have what we call the triple three strategy. It is the three goals that our pastoral care team has set earlier this year to help people in our church to connect with each other. The first three means that if we do not see somebody for three weeks in a row, we contact them to see if they are okay. And the second three means that we try to help everybody in this church family to make at least three friends within the church family. And the last three means that if we see somebody new to our church, before their third visit here, we invite them out for a meal or coffee so that we get to know them. And I believe it is something that everyone in this church family should do, don't you think? Not just our pastoral care team. This morning, take out somebody for a meal or coffee. I will pay for you. <laughs> I'm kidding, okay? <laughs> yeah, we love you too. Yeah. The Bible says two are better off than one. If one of them falls down, the, the, the other can help them up. And this morning, how's your family life? How is your marriage? If it's gone a little pear-shaped lately, how about starting with having a nice dinner together one night and trying to do it more regularly? And when you get together, just to share one thing that you could give God thanks for. It is the continuation of ordinary things that makes our life extraordinary. Now, in today's story, we see Jesus having a dinner at Matthew's house with some new friends. And it was a scandalous. And the religious leaders of the day were infuriated by it. Why? Who is Matthew? What do we know about him? Matthew is a tax collector. That means Matthew was everybody's enemy. The best way to put it is probably this. The tax collectors were like the Jews who worked for Nazis during World War II, or Ukrainians who worked for the Russian military. In Jesus' day, Jews were living under the Roman rule, and tax collectors worked for Romans, extracting money from their own countrymen. They were greatly corrupted. They were greatly despised and hated by their fellow Jews. And on the top of that, at the dinner, there were people who the Pharisees called the sinners, the original Greek word for sinners here refers to criminals. And this was why the religious elites, the Pharisees, were infuriated by Jesus for having a meal at Matthew's place. And here we see one thing about Jesus. Jesus is not a religious type. He is not a religious leader. Rather, Jesus upsets religious people. Now, <clears throat> It might come to you as a shock, but <clears throat> like Jesus, his followers, Christians, are also not religious. When shopping at supermarket, I've made, this made, made, uh, I've made this mistake many times, and I still do at times. When I want to buy a shampoo, I accidentally pick up a hair conditioner. When I want to buy a moisturizer, I accidentally pick up a face washer. Now you might be thinking, Noah, you don't look like you use any moisturizer, but I do. Okay, I do. Anyway, does anyone make 
the same mistake as I do? Why do we do that? We pick up the wrong bottles because they look the same on the outside. They look the same on the surface. Religious people and Christians look the same on the outside. But they are completely different on the inside. Their motivations and hearts are different. This morning, if you have been going to church for some time, here is a little test that you and I could use on ourselves to see if we are religious or Christian. Jesus says to the religious people, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. First, do you see the contrast here? Whilst Jesus is with the people, religious people would just go and focus on increasing their head knowledge. Their learning would be just for themselves, not for the people who are in need. To religious people, what they know is more important than what they do with it. It is something that I have to watch out as a pastor. Secondly, Jesus says whilst his followers would focus on mercy, religious people would focus on sacrifice. Now, this is a quote from one of the older Jewish scriptures, the book of Hosea in the Old Testament. What Jesus is saying is that religious people do all religious practices, and yet they fail to maintain their in, uh, essential heart. There is no joy, there is no heartfelt repentance, no willingness to change, no willingness to live for God and honor God with their lives. They despise people who do not measure up. They are judgmental, they think of themselves as morally superior, and they think that they can fix bad people. Matthew's story throws a question to all of us this morning. Are you a Christian or a religious person? Are you a follower of Christ or another religious freak? Surprisingly, in the story, it is Matthew, the tax collector, who shows what true Christianity is all about. The text says, when Jesus called Matthew and said, follow me, Matthew almost instantly responded to that call. Matthew wanted to change. He saw the need for change in his life, and he saw that he needed God to change. This tells us something. Jesus' followers would see that they need God in their lives, and that without the posture of a surrender in their hearts, they can never experience God's power and love that changed them. Here Jesus says, unless you see me as a doctor who you can be honest with about your struggles and sins, I don't mean anything to you. Friends, we all traverse through life with luggage. No one on earth is perfect. We don't always make the right choices. We don't always say and do the right things. We all have regrets. We all have experienced rejection. We all had, have had moments of self-doubt. And we are all trying to earn our self-worth from something. And we all want to be a better version of ourselves. We are all like Matthew in one way or another. And Jesus comes to us and he does not say, here is another code of rules that you must comply with to be a ver better version of yourself. But he simply says this, come, let's have a dinner together. In other words, he says, you simply identify yourself with me and you let me in your heart and your life then you will not just be a better person, but you will be a new person. You will not perish, but have eternal life. Friends, there is one thing that we all face in this life. That is death. No one escapes it. We all die. And nobody knows how and when we would stand at the door, of, door to death and what is on the other side of that door. Only God knows that. 
So how can we say, I don't need God? Death is inevitable and it comes to every one of us. A Christian writer named Ouyang Lee said this, the biggest tragedy in the modern world is that death is dead. Modern people deny the fact that they will one day have to face death so that they do not see their need of God. You know, most cultures have some, have some concept of, of human failure. All religions have a concept of a debt to be paid. And they say if it is not dealt with, there will be consequences. Hinduism teaches that we need to reincarnate and suffer to pay off your debt, karma. In Islam, they say at the judgment seat, you will be given a scale and your good works needed to outweigh your bad works to pay off your debt. Otherwise, you will perish. All world's religions say that there are certain rules and rituals that you must comply with and you should measure up and live up to a certain standard to get God's favor and be saved. But look closely at what Jesus says here. Look at what kind of God Jesus is. Why does Jesus say he can focus on being merciful instead of demanding us to pay off debts through sacrifices? That is because Jesus himself became a sacrifice. On the cross, Jesus gave himself as a sacrifice to pay our debts. He died our debts. He took the penalty for our sins. And John 3.16 says, Whoever believes in Jesus Christ will not perish and have eternal life. Only Christianity of all other world religions and belief systems says that God himself pays our debts. And the only thing that we need to do is to open the door of our hearts to let him in. He says there is nothing more that we need to do. All the work has been done. Our debt is paid in full by Jesus Christ. This morning, what is it that weighs you down? Here is the thing. I don't think when Jesus called Matthew, he knew everything about Jesus to trust him. But Matthew responded to Jesus' calling because he was desperate. Perhaps Jesus was the straw that he clutched at. He wanted to be a better person. He wanted the truth that will set him free. He wanted to know if there was more to life. And he chose Jesus as the answer. What is it that weighs you down this morning? Whether it is some worries of life or fear of death, you will find the answer and hope in Jesus Christ. Think about Jesus at Matthew's house. What is Jesus saying? He is just saying, I am the God who comes to you. I don't care who you are. No matter what your record, no matter how ashamed you are of yourself, no matter how, you low, how low you feel, no matter how guilty you are, no matter what has been done to you and your life, no matter how defiled and stained you feel yourself to be, I will come to you. And I can make you whole again. This morning, where are you? Where is Jesus in your life? Is Jesus inside your heart or standing on the other side of the door of your heart and waiting for you to open that door? Would you open the door of your heart to him? I want to finish by reading out something from the scripture. It is Mark chapter 6, verse, 15, uh, verse 56. Wherever Jesus went into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick, 
in the marketplaces. People were so desperate that they begged Jesus to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. And the scripture says, everyone who touched it were healed. Everyone who touched it were healed. This morning, he is knocking at the door of your heart. Would you let it in? In my preparation for sermon last week, I just had this sense that God wants to heal you and he can heal you, but you will have to open the door. It is you who can open the door. He's already at the doorstep. So would you make that decision? Would you let him in? I'm not just talking to new Christians. I'm talking to everybody here. Let us pray. Jesus, we come to you this morning as you have come to us first. We give you thanks for your gift of life and how willing you are to give the life. In our lives, we've got regrets for the mistakes that we made. We've got luggages that we want to throw out of our lives. And we've tried to do it or not do it on our own but we failed and this morning we choose to hold on to you we are desperate of you we open our hearts that you may come in lift us up heal us touch us Make us whole again. We choose you to be the answer. And we thank you that it is your promise that you have good plans and purpose for us. The plans to heal us, to give us a hope and new future. We choose you, Jesus. This morning we are going to take a moment